In this video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about software, specifically as far as types of software, but also what goes into actually purchasing it and upgrading your software. As many of you know, uh, in this course, we will be using the Microsoft Office suite as far as exploring and learning a little bit more about how to utilize the software package to create our own content. So let's go all the way back though. What is or how uh, was the main way that we used to buy software? Well, in the olden days, you would actually, you know, I'm sure many of you remember this, you'd go into the computer store, there would be a box on the shelf that had your specific set of software on it that you would buy the box, you'd bring it home, it would be stored on some sort of floppy disk or a CD-ROM, and you would then install it to your computer. I don't know if anybody remembers, you know, we even did this with things like web browsers. Web browsers such as like Internet Explorer and at the time Netscape, it wasn't a matter that you just went out to the internet and downloaded it. What you had to do was you actually had to go to the store and buy a copy of it. The problem with this process though that we started to run into was a lot of pirating of software where pretty much people would hack the software where they could get the keys that would identify it as a legit a piece of software and people would turn around and not pay for the software packages. Again, in the long run, one thing to consider here is yes, there were a lot of folks that felt as though, you know, yeah, I'm showing Microsoft or yeah, I'm showing Firefox or Netscape or any of these big companies. Really though, you're hurting, you know, the employees more so than uh, the actual, um, you know, higher ups there. So to alleviate the issue, what people began to do as we got with the internet and things like that, and the internet became more predominant in households, uh, was we now have moved to a subscription-based model for a lot of software packages. What this means is, is you almost want to consider, yes, you are downloading the software package. Yes, you are installing it to your computer. Whenever you get those pop-up windows and you're hitting next and telling it where to install and it's okay to do that, you almost want to think, though, that you're actually renting the software. You're paying a monthly fee of some sort normally that enables you to be able to have access to this software. And every time that you boot up this piece of software, nine times out of ten, you're going to need some form of internet connection because the software package, what it's going to do is it's going to phone home, make sure your account is up to date, paid, etc., and then it will give you access. Now, this all happens in the blink of an eye. Having said that, um, you know, this is something that kind of has, you know, been received with mixed feelings. One big thing is, is, okay, equity. When you think about this, you know, yes, uh, you know, a lot of people have access to the internet in their homes. However, across the globe, there are still patches in the world that they don't have constant internet access. What this means is, you know, having a model like this, this actually not only deters folks, but also can even keep them from being able to learn or work with industry standard software. And that brings me to my next point here, as far as talking about, you know, let's use an example here. I use Microsoft Office since that's what we're using in this course. One of the links I provided you here, and let me go ahead and bring this up for you, was if you wanted to buy Microsoft for a 365 family where you could have up to five or six people, you're looking at uh, $99.99 a year or $10 a month. And the thing is, is you would have to continually pay that $10 a month or $100 a year to constantly have not only access to all of the software packages, not only being able to access it on any of your devices, but also to making sure that you keep your storage space as well. Also with that, you could go down to a one person a year, which would be $7 a month. Now, as a student though, you do have access to the software package for free. So long as you're using that academic email, you are good to go on that. Problem is though, is if once you graduate and you are disconnected from your academic email, you now lose access to the Microsoft Office suite. Um, 
Again, as I mentioned here, this is a big marketing tactic. The idea that, okay, you've now learned to use the software program and now it's like, okay, I can't learn, I can't use anything else. This is further enforced as far as if you think about your companies or employers, a lot of these companies, we talk about, you may have heard me mention earlier, industry standard software. The industry standard software, a lot of these companies, they pretty much budget assuming they are going to use Microsoft Office. You're not going to find a lot of companies using what we call open source software, which I'll talk about here a little later. So when you're thinking about these different packages here, just keep in mind that, yes, you could get access to your software package of choice, again, depending on where you end up working, or if you are currently at a job that, yes, they do have access to that. And you got to remember for a lot of these larger corporations, you know, the idea of having to provide Microsoft Office licenses to, say, you know, 500 employees is, can often be considered a drop in the bucket as far as money is concerned. I also gave you a couple of other just examples here, actually from my realm with multimedia. Uh, the biggest one for cloud-based software as far as packaging goes would actually be the Adobe Creative Cloud. Adobe Creative Cloud is a rough one, uh, simply because of the fact that we really don't have a lot of open source options that actually come in line with the software packages. Adobe really cornered the multimedia market, so it's kind of, yeah, you're stuck having to go through and pretty much, yes, I pay $53 a month to have access to the software packages that are needed to do my job. As you get into other areas, I also included Maya here in case anybody was curious. Maya for a year is in the thousands uh, as far as costs are concerned. Again, though, one of the biggest issues you may run into as far as your futures when you're working with these soft with installing software, just be aware. The odds are good you are probably going to have some sort of monthly fee with them. You're, I would tell you to always think in terms of you're renting the software. And then lastly, also, you're not going to get reminders as far as the charges are concerned. A lot of these companies, um, it is another you know marketing tactic where they hope that you register for the software package and it doesn't matter if you use it every day or not, you are going to be charged for that time. So after that big bad scary speech, let's talk a little bit here. Do you have options? Um, very much so. Uh, we have what is called open source software. Uh, as far as computers are concerned. This is a mentality, a movement, I'd almost call it, whereby a lot of folks believe that you should not have to pay for software access to core software elements, uh, you know, that, pe that companies are, you know, keeping this content behind a paywall. So while the software package may not be exactly the same as the industry standard software, the good news is, is honestly, and I'll show you an example here in a moment, if you know something like Microsoft Office, let's use Microsoft Word as an example even, the odds are good you can fumble through open source software such as Google Docs or LibreOffice. Buttons might be in some different places, but you will be able to find them. I often use the example in my multimedia courses, things like Maya, 3D modeling and animation. We have a pretty hefty software, open source software package called Blender. If you know your way around a program like Maya, you can fumble your way through Blender. So some of the examples I included that you do have links for that if you wanted to explore these after the class, probably the biggest one, and let me bring up the web here. Let me bring up my browser to show you. The first one is LibreOffice. Uh, LibreOffice is a really great uh, open source package uh, that you can use. Honestly, again, if you have learned Microsoft Office, you are capable of very much so kind of fumbling your way through something like LibreOffice. The beauty of these type of packages as well, um, you're not locked away from being able to work with Microsoft Office files. And we'll talk about the Office file extensions when we get into the programs. But you can write up a, pro, write up a Word document, let's say, uh, in LibreOffice, and you can save it as a Microsoft Office Word uh, file. Likewise, you could uh, do a spreadsheet in LibreOffice. 
you could save it as an Excel file. Are you given an Excel file from a colleague or a friend or something in your freelancing? You can also open those types of files in LibreOffice. Likewise, another example would be Google Drive. Google Drive, or Google Docs actually, is not as in-depth as something like LibreOffice or Microsoft Office because of the fact that one nice thing about Google Docs is it's completely in the web browser. You don't have to download anything. However, we do lose some capabilities such as in Google Sheets. It's not as powerful as Microsoft Office's Excel or LibreOffice's version of Excel. However, if you're doing basics and you're not doing data analytics uh, and you're just needing to make a resume or maybe make a presentation, Google Docs is actually a phenomenal choice. And again, like its counterparts here, you are able to go in and you can download it as a PowerPoint file type, you can download it as a Word file type, you can download them as an Excel file type as well. So you have all of these different options here as far as the different types of software available to you. I hope that this discussion here has kind of given you some ideas. Finally, the only last thing I'd like to address here is I often get the question of, well, why do I need to learn Office then? Again, going back to corporations and companies, to pay for access for something like the Office Suite, paying for 500 employees is not a lot of money to these companies. Also to Microsoft, very often in many of these companies, not just Microsoft, I shouldn't pick on them, uh, the higher you go in numbers of licenses you need, they start to give you discounts. So while you want to be able to work your way around in the office suite or whatever industry standard software package you're working in, understand that it isn't the end all be all that if you lose access because you're not a student anymore, you still have other options of software that you will still be able to do the work without having to pay for access to the software suite.